The midweek drop you're about to listen to is related to episode 158, titled Ministry of Parenthood. If you want to have the best experience of the conversation you're about to listen to, I strongly suggest that you go back and listen to episode 158 beforehand. This is my song. This is my jam. It's the midweek drop, yeah. This is my song. This is right. My song. Hey, what's happening, ladies and gentlemen? This is your host, Tin Tone. Welcome to another episode of The Feeling Station. For those who are joining us for the first time, this is a romantic friendship. friendship. Oh, jeez. Did you hear that? Joke? I heard it. I heard it. And, and off, off, the, off the bat, my off guy. The cuff, right? <laughs> Let's try that again. This is a romantic family and friendship breakup podcast focusing on stories that people would like to talk about with a view to give you lessons from their experiences. And this is what I know and called the midweek drop. Yep. And what that is essentially is just a little episode to give people a little entertainment during the week, especially on hump day. So the intention is to release it on, on a Wednesday. Oh, hold, hold on a second. Mm. Did you just say hump day? Of course, hump day. No, 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 my brother, my brother, my brother. <laughs> Get that mind straight out Yo, the gutter. Oh, wow. Out the gutter. Wow. Right? You know, yeah, the concept of hump day, I'm not even going to try and bother explaining that because I got tired of trying to explain Black History Month in October. All right, all right. So spare me the trouble, I beg go. <laughs> Abi. Right. So yeah, so so this is just to take people over the line. And um, for those feelers who've been on this podcast long enough, you know that I normally do this solo. Oh. So this is the fun part for me this time. I have my brother Nino Brown in the house today, y'all. A round of applause, please. Nino Brown, thank you for accepting the invitation for you to come and co-host this with me. Thank you for having me. Um, and the reason why I chose you specifically is once upon a time when we were driving, going up to Birmingham mm. to go look at some cars, you listened to episode 15, which happens to be the podcast favorite episode called Captain Planet. That's the one. Right? That's and the one. there's a lot of stuff that we, you know, that he spoke about that was quite outlandish. But there's this one comment that you made that got me thinking, God damn, I'd not thought about things this way. And I thought you'd be the perfect candidate to come onto the podcast. Well, you know what? It is a pleasure to be here. And I've been wanting to be on the podcast for a while. And it is happening. And you've just the voice. So I better warn you, DMs are going to get busy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> bring them, bring them, bring them on. Ready. So to, to, kick, um, to, kick, to kick start this episode, um, it was really triggered by the fact that in episode 158, mm. um, it's titled Miniature of Parenthood. Yeah. My guest basically said, you know, parenthood should really become a ministry because leaving the duty of becoming a parent and raising someone should not be delegated uh -huh. to people. It should be that duty of the parent because God has blessed you with that child. Take it with all your arms and run with it. Wow. That was the running theme. And then off the back of that, and I'm grateful for people that listen to this on Spotify because you get an opportunity to answer the questions I ask on the episode. Yeah. And the question that I asked is, do you want children? Question mark. If yes, do you want to share why? Why do you want to have a child? And then if you don't want to have a child, would you care to share as well? Interesting. So I got six responses to that. Yeah. And I wanted to go through these with you. Go on. For the benefit of those listening. Now, it's important for me to put this out as a disclaimer. We are not psychologists. Mm -hmm. We don't profess to be psychologists. No. We don't profess to be anthropologists either to no. understand human behavior and how the mind works. It's just personal opinion. And it's just two brothers having a conversation about what people have said in response to the question. Fact, fact. So please don't come running after us with your guns blazing and saying, hey, you're not trained. Hey, listen, we know that already. So calm down. <laughs> Easy, brethren. We're not trying to catch strays. <laughs> so the first response that I got is, is really a simple one that needs no discussion. Mm -hmm. But out of respect and sheer appreciation for somebody responding to this, the question is, do you want to have children? They just said, yes, I want to. And that was it. To address response number one out the way. You look disappointed. So, no, no, no. No, do you, do you know what I was actually thinking? What? This issue about having children. Mm. We have people that want to have children. Yes. But can't have children. Oh, yeah. That are trying and have been trying, but it's not happening. Mm. So is she in that category? 
Is this one of those people that wants children but can't have children? Has been trying, but it hasn't happened. Is she one of those? Because if she is, then I feel for her. Mm. It's just like someone who's been looking for a husband or a wife mm. and it's not been happening. It's almost like it consumes you inside. So the question is, what category does she fit into? Right. You see what I mean when I say that word? I needed to have you on this because <laughs> did you see how quickly I was about to dismiss that response? Mm. Because it's literally four words. Yes, I want to. Yeah. Period. Exactly. But now there's a whole lot more context. Yeah. Can she have one? Exactly. We don't know. Yes. Does she have the person to have it with? Yes. We don't know. Has she been trying? We don't know. We don't know. Ah, thanks, bro. Ish. To the one who responded, and, and I can't really say who because it, the, the, the podcast thrives on anonymity. Yep. So that response is purely, I want to. Mm. And I, I guess the only hope that we can have for you, because we we've got no more context around this, is we pray that it becomes your reality one day. Absolutely. Whatever the circumstances are. Absolutely. Be it IVF, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Response number two to the question, do you want to have children? Mm -hmm. Um, this individual is female. That's all I can disclose. And she goes, nope. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> that's the first thing. Nope. And a solid, solid full stop. And then next up, she goes, it's emotionally, financially, mentally, and physically taxing. Full stop. Not everyone is fit to be a mother. And I'm okay with not having any. The thought of it just gives me palpitations. Hold on a second. Mm. Do you know the first thing that came to mind? Mm. The first thing is, what has happened to her in her past for her not to have children? For her not to want to have children? That's the first thing that came to mind. Because if you were traumatized as a child, or if you viewed, or if you witnessed something traumatic as a child, you don't want to have children. Mm. Maybe it was a situ situation where maybe the parents were separated or divorced. Mm. Maybe they struggled financially as a family. What has happened for her not to want to have children? Is it because of the fact that the first thing she wrote, there is nope and a full stop? Exactly. So it feels accentuated. Exactly. Because there might be something that drove. There is, to me, I'm thinking, what has happened in your life for you not mm. to want to have children? Mm. Mm. Because I believe it's innate, and it's, it's innate in most of us. To want to, what is it called? Procreate. Procreate. Mm. Exactly. Now, I'm not saying everybody's going to have children, but it's natural to have children, isn't it? So I'm thinking, what has happened for you to make that very solid decision? I do not want to have children. Mm. I have one of my own, mm -hmm. and you have some, right? And what I want to perhaps touch on here is what she says next and and she's got f uh, four things that she says are taxing on a human the first being emotionally taxing yes um and maybe i will just allude to what that has been like for me emotionally as far as having a child is concerned yeah i've, I've had this conversation with you multiple times and i said to you my son wasn't planned mm. my son is not something that i sat down and said i'm ready to have a child i want to do this However, when he came, um, the first three months, my brain couldn't make sense of what this is, what my role is, what my involvement is, and what I'm expected to do for him. Because you're not, you're not taught no, it, to be a parent. I definitely wasn't taught to be a parent. You learn as you go along, right? Yeah, and, and I guess it's one of those things that you can't be taught because the object is, is not available to test and try until it's born. Exactly. So, you know, when they teach you first aid and stuff, they'll give you a dummy mm. that you can, you know, do the compressions on and then you, you do, do CPR mm. and whatever, that mouth-to-mouth -mouth stuff. Mm. So you get something to practice on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With a baby, bro, you're waiting for nine months. It's baking. And when it comes out, and I had the privilege of cutting my son's umbilical cord. Wow. The first thing that told me, brother, what you thought and what reality are are completely different is how tough that damn cord is. 
<laughs> in my head, do you know, do you know what I genuinely thought? I thought it was going to be like snipping a piece of paper. Snip, I and mean, it's gone. I had to do a double take and then I became nervous when I realized, yo, this thing is actually tough. Of course. So, so you don't have this practice. Mm-hmm. So this person says that this is emotionally taxing. Yeah. Right? I know what it's like to mourn a loved one because I've lost my mother. Mm-hmm. So I know exactly what that emotion is like. Mm-hmm. Before she passed, I couldn't sit down and say, I know what you're feeling because I'll be lying. Mm-hmm. But when, so how once you it, went through it. Yeah. So how is it possible that somebody who doesn't have a child can say it's emotionally taxing? Which is, which is why I alluded to the fact that something must have happened in her past. Because for her to make that statement, mm. she is taking it from a personal point of view. But as you said, she doesn't have children. So it must, have been, it must have been something that she experienced as a child. That doesn't, so she doesn't want to have children based on her experience. Mm. But her experience is as a child and not a parent. I see what you mean. So saying yeah. based on this what is, I received as a child from exactly. my parents, this it is, must this be, is, surely it's taxing to be a parent. This is now conjecture. This is just conjecture. Bruh, college word fam. <laughs> what the hell is conjecture? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what does conjecture mean? This is my personal opinion. Okay, 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 gotcha. Without mm-hmm. knowing the facts. Yeah, so this is, this is mm-hmm. a hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Without having the facts. As you say, it's just, it's just a discussion, right? Yeah. We don't know the background. Nope. We would have to speak to the individual. to give us a bit of a background. So this is just us speculating. So emotionally for you, focusing on just that one component of this response. Yes. How has it been for you emotionally being a parent? Wow. It is emotionally draining. It is emotionally draining. I will not lie. However... Mm. The joy that the kids mm-hmm. give me overshadows that emotion or the negativity a hundred times over. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my son was a very sick child. He, was, he, has, he had a very weak chest. He was in and out of hospital as a child. Um, and it wasn't unusual for us to be up at 2, 3 in the morning driving him to A&E because he was unwell. Mm. It wasn't unusual for us to be up for 24, 48 hours, you know, sitting with him, sitting next to him in a bed in a hospital because Mm. he was unwell. Mm. And then having to, you know, call in sick to work in one day and then going to work the next day and not having slept, you know. So it was draining. But at the same time, this is is what I say to, to anyone that's having a baby. You know, when you see that baby... Smile for the first time. Laugh for the first time. Reach out and grab something for the first time. Take those first few steps. Stand, walk. Feed themselves for the first time. Oh my goodness. Start having conversations. When the child starts to talk and you have those conversations with a, with a toddler and they understand what you're saying. Oh my goodness. You know, it is, as you said, if you've, if you've not experienced it, and experience that, it's difficult to explain it to somebody else. But it brings so much joy. And that joy overshadows any emotional negativity a hundred times over. If you can allow me just to reinforce that a little bit, because the number of times you said the first, the first, the first, the first. Mm. I remember seeing my son's first poo. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wish I didn't have to say it like that, but I remember seeing his first poop mm. within the first week. They call it Niconium, if I remember. That's it. That thing is as dark as fuck, right? That yep. thing is a black. Yep. <laughs> right? None of this brown stuff that we see when it's been purified. <laughs> Isn't it funny how, you know, when you purify water, it becomes really clear. Yep. When you purify poo, it becomes brown. <laughs> and that's the transition my son went through. So, but seeing that first who that he did. Yeah. I was like, yo, this is uh, a bit messy, but yeah, you know, something has happened to the digestive system. That's telling you that he's healthy. Exactly. So it's the first confirmation your yeah. son is healthy. Exactly. But also, it's not really the first event that you're like, thank God. Yeah. 
the fact that they cry when they come out of the womb. Yes. Is that first registration for me that, oh, this is dope. Yes. Right? So that's the first. Mm. Iconium was the second first. Mm. I didn't know kids kind of shed their skin. Oh, yeah. You know, they look scaly the first few days. Yeah, yeah, So that yeah, was yeah. the first for me to see in recognition. And just to support what you said, the fact that he, uh, the first few days his eyes would wander around and they're not focusing on you. Mm. And then you clock the focus. Yes. And you're like, okay, now we're starting to focus. Yeah. The first time that he actually latches onto the nipple and he does it successfully. Yes. Um, and then the transition from milk to solids and the oh. farts that come through <laughs> with that brother. <laughs> <laughs> that is a first I will <laughs> never forget. I was like, what is this? Right? But I'm just reinforcing what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And again, this is not poking fingers at whoever said this. Mm-hmm. But you can't tell a virgin what it's like to have sex. Of course not. And you can't tell a man what it's like to experience a period. Exactly. You can only refer and infer. Exactly. And I guess that's what we're doing here to say to whoever wrote this. Yes. This challenge that you're having, you're saying emotionally it is draining. It is draining. A hundred percent. But in the same breath, there's risk and reward. I, absolutely. Right. And the, the, the downside of risk Versus the reward you get if you do things properly mm. outweighs any emotional taxing you could, you could have. And for me, that has been my experience. Absolutely. And actually, you know, she mentioned about the financial constraints. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the second one. You so, know. So, so that's a nice segue into the next one, financial. Yeah, I mean, the, the financial constraints. You know, some people will say, you know, they want to wait to a point in their lives where they're financially stable mm. so they can care for the child, mm. you know, appropriately. Yep. And they can provide for that child and they can have that security, which is understandable. And if that is you and that is your perspective, it's absolutely fine. But there's never a perfect time. And actually, there's a lot of people that will have, let's call them accidents. <laughs> Man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm. So what happens if you have a little accident? Mm. You're still going to have to look after that child, right? Yeah. So what happens in that situation? You have to find the means. And if, so they say, if something is a priority for you, you will find a way. So having that financial stability is important, I understand. Mm. I get it. Mm. But there's never a perfect time to have a child. Even if you don't have that money, you will make a way. Especially being in a welfare state in this country. I'm not yeah. saying that you should go for welfare, don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. But that assistance is always there if you do need it. Mm-hmm. I can really support that a million percent. Because mm. remember I said my, um, my son would not sit down and say, hey, let's have this fella. If yeah. you do grown up shit, you get grown up results. Yeah. Right? So he comes in. Let's assume I was earning a thousand a month. Mm. Right? Um, 14 months after he was born, decided that it was time for his mom to go to work. And what that basically meant was he needed to be looked after at a nursery. So yeah. we popped him into an amazing nursery. <laughs> the bill for his nursery was 1,200 pounds. Wow. Bear in mind, we had set incomes and they've been set for a long time. Mm. then you now need to find a thousand two hundred pounds a month from somewhere you have to make a plan to cover that bill had to make a plan revisited my work situation revisited where i was and realized i need to make changes immediately it wasn't a case of saying i need to plan to do this study i had to make changes immediately and i'm grateful to god that an opportunity came through that allowed me to make that change and my change in income was genuinely 1200 a month. So I wasn't better off financially yeah. in my own being as Tinto. But you were able to pay the, the nursery fees. But I was able fees. to pay the nursery fees. There you go. And without realizing, I had actually increased my income per annum. Yes. Just by this little man coming into the world. Exactly. Now I started thinking about where I want to take him for school. Mm. And now my mindset had to shift again immediately. No time ah. for it to say, oh, I'm going to... Uh-uh. So, this needs to happen now. So what you've just touched on mm. is another point. Mm. Because once you decide to have children, or yeah. actually maybe you haven't made that decision, this is a little accident. Mm-hmm. 
But once you have that child, mm. you have to make those lifestyle changes. Say no more. Say less. Because you have someone that you need to, that's someone that a little child is now relying on you. You can't go out to the club anymore. You can't be buying bottles of Azul every weekend. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Azul who? <laughs> Azul. <laughs> uh, you can't be shopping at Louis V. What? You have to go to Primark, my brother. <laughs> 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 yeah, I understand. So you have to change your lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is something that, that's very subjective. Mm. Because I've seen little kids dressed in, you know, Prada from head to toe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. But that is, that is a decision that you have to make as a parent. Mm, mm. You know? But the point I'm trying to make is, once a child comes along, mm -hmm. your life is changed forever. 100%. 100%. And just to add on to that financial component we were just talking about now, when, that, when my income changed in that year without me realizing I've changed it, it gave me drive because now I started projecting to say I don't want to be in a situation where I got shocked by this 1200 bill. If I want my son to go to private school, if I want him to have extra lessons for this, extracurricular activities for that, I need to make the money available. So my mindset changed immediately. There you go. To say, I should not let my personal choice in terms of what my work situation looks like limit opportunities for my son. Absolutely. And ever since that happened, I've been forward thinking. And between the time he was born in 2017 and where I am now, I have tripled my income. Wow. More power to which you, is, Which is contrary to what this response is saying, that it could be financially crippling. Mm. But again, we're not judging. We're just giving the flip side of what having a child does. And, and actually, it's, it's a mindset, isn't it? Mm. It's a mindset, like most things in life. Because if you view a child as a burden, yeah. they become a burden. Mm. But if you view the child as an asset, that child is now carrying your name. Mm. That child has your DNA. That is your legacy. That child will love you unconditionally. Those are all positive things. Mm. If you look at that situation in a positive light, in a positive way, mm. then your mindset changes as well, isn't it? And this is what I say even to my kids. Everything in life is about assets and liabilities. Mm. If you view a child as an asset, you will invest in that child. Amen to that. If you view the child as a liability, then you will not invest in that child, which is, which is the next point I'm going to talk about. Not everyone is a natural parent. Bro, I, are you looking at my notes or something? <laughs> 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 You're on the other side of the desk. I've not seen, I've not seen your nose, brother. This is ridiculous. Because what you, you've literally gone into the third component of this response, which is mentally. Interesting. Because they say that it's mentally taxing. But you've just literally just said what you decide to say in your mind about what this child should be is what, your result, is what becomes you. It your becomes execution. you. It becomes you mentally. Exactly. And exactly. I, I can back that up. But remember, I told you my son wasn't planned. Yes. I can't sit here and say that his mother will say, oh yeah, Tinder, you were involved. I'd be lying. The first nine months was a mind fuck for me. Because mm. I've come from, ah, I'm not sure I want to have kids to, yo, this dude is coming. Right? And yeah. I didn't know what to expect or what to think. It affected my behavior. It affected my mood. It affected my contribution to what was happening at, in terms of choice of a cot bed. Mm choice of clothes, colors, names, mm -hmm. kind of felt a bit detached. Mm -hmm. Until after three months that he got, came into the world, then month number four, I'm like, yo, hold up a sec. This stuff is actually quite dope, which is that mental shift you're talking about. Yeah. But I like how you say you can choose to do this, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie to you, Nino Brown. It wasn't an obvious choice for me. I hear you. It was only in which month is, which, four which is, which that is, I'm like, I need to decide yeah. whether I'm going to be like this, which is withdrawn and, hey, I didn't really ask for this. Yeah. To saying, well, why not try and embrace and see this, what this is about? And that was the life-changing moment for me. Yeah. 
this, this, this is why I say it's very subjective. It is very subjective. It's, you can't compare your situation to anybody else's situation. Yeah. It's going to be very, very different, which is why you should not compare children either because the way they develop and the way they progress is very different. Mm. And yet, the powers that be have dictated that at this age, a child should be doing this. At this mm. age, a child should be this height, this weight. They should mm. be able to dress themselves. But no, it, it is very subjective. But going back to this whole thing about parenthood, I believe that it's not innate in us to be good parents. It's a choice. It's a decision that you have to make. Mm. This is my son. This is my daughter. This is my child. I need to look after this child. Mm. We hear so many cases about children being neglected. We hear so many parents about, uh, sorry, so so many um, uh, newspaper reports about parents abusing their own children, which is very sad. And yet it happens, right? Mm. So it's not innate in us to be good parents. It's a decision that you have to make. It has to come from within. It's not someone that's, you know, it's not something that you are taught. It's not something that, you, are, you know, you, you are born with. Yeah. It's a decision you have to make. Yeah. I'm now a parent. Mm. I have a God, I've got a child to look after. Mm. I have to provide for this child. I have to love this child. Mm. And actually love is, how do you show love to a, a child? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how that has happened for me. I didn't wake up saying, I'm going to love this child. Mm -hmm. I woke up saying, I'm going to show up for this child. There you go. That's that's, that's, that's interesting you should say that. And as a result of showing up, love has come on top of that. Yeah. And and I'll tell you something that uh, I am eternally grateful for. The fact that my mom and my dad were very expressive to me and they made it known that, you know, Tinto, we love you. And they said it. They just didn't say it. I felt it. You know, I would, yeah. hug, I would hug my mom. Yeah. She didn't even need to tell me I love you because I felt <laughs> it. That is interesting because I was just about to say, mm. my father mm. has never told me in his life that he loves me. Never. And yet I know he loves me. My mother tells me every single time I talk to her, she tells me, son, I love you. Every single time. My father, on the other hand, has never said those words to me, ever. And yet I know this man loves me. Love is an action. Mm. Because I can tell you I love you Mm. and still beat you up. Mm. Is that love? Depends which part of the world you are. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're in the third world, brother, if you grew up, that's a hell of a lot of love, right? <laughs> get your ass whooped. The more times you get your ass whooped, the more in love this person is. <laughs> but then come in here and you whoop, whoop your kids, son. You, you whoop your kids' ass. Oh, you going to jail. You're going to jail. So, I, I don't know. No, but it's, so there's, there's, there's different ways to yeah. express love, love to yeah, a yeah, child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You can tell your child I love you all the time. You can hug your child and mm. be affectionate and kiss your child and hug your child all the time. Or you can be there for that child. You can yeah. provide for that child. Mm-hmm. Making sure the child is fed. They've got clothes. They've got a warm bed to sleep in. They've got a, you know, you take them to school. Mm-hmm. There's different ways to express that love. You know, I, I keep referring to this episode and I pray to that any to God that anybody listening to this episode at least tries to go and search for it. I'll put it up on Twitter again because I do it all the damn time. Damon Dash, mm. right, was having a conversation with Steve Bartlett on Diary of a CEO. Yeah. And he said, children do not give, excuse my French, children do not give a fuck about what you give them. They want your time. They want your time. A hundred. And he keeps saying it over and over and over and over again. A hundred. So the less time that you're giving these people, Mm. the more of a disservice that you're doing for yourself. That's powerful. That is powerful right there. That is powerful. 
So this takes me to the last component. Do you know what is really frustrating for me right now? Mm. I only have 45 minutes to digest this. <laughs> Right what, and and what, and we are what, what approaching are we on? and we're, we're point number two out of six. <laughs> <laughs> we're number two out of six. We're number two out of six. Right? Oh, let's let's and, let's and, let's and, let's let's speed it along. Let's speed it along. Well, we, you know we can speed, it, but I do I definitely don't want to rush it. So if if anything, if I can slip in the, a, a third point, I will, which is a one liner. Okay. But the last component of this very first response is that it's physically taxing. Yeah, I, right. I, I understand that. Yeah, you do? Yep. Can I put my hand up and say something? Go on. Look at my belly, brother. <laughs> when, uh, when, but when I spoke to you, I, I, when I spoke to you a year ago, all, I see, all, I, am, all I see is a D'Angelo V, my brother. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel? <laughs> right? I'm, I'm, I'm making my way towards that. And, and I, I'm not going to sit down and say, oh, it's because I'm doing so much in the gym. A good 70% of that is that little fella making me run around the park like a <laughs> madman trying to catch up with him and trying to match his energy on football, Yo. trying to match his energy with running, trying to match his energy with so much stuff. Wow. I, I kissed waking up at 10 a.m. in the morning goodbye five years ago. Of course, you wake up when he wakes because up. Because you wake up when he wakes up. You do you do stuff together physically when when he does it. Yeah. How many times did your son say, "Daddy, I'm bored"? Oh, all the time. All the goddamn time. And what <laughs> do you do? You have to entertain them, my brother. And what does that entertainment involve for the bulk of the time? Well, you know what? Mm. When he was younger, we spent a lot of time outdoors. Mm. But it got to a stage where I had things clocked. Mm. So I would, us spending time together needed to be something that is enjoyable for the both of us. Yeah. Because if he's just doing stuff that he enjoys all the time, mm. I'm going to start resenting spending time with him. Mm. But if I enjoy that time with him, mm -hmm. then it's enjoyable for the both of us. Mm -hmm. So we could go outside. He's playing around. I'm playing with him. But at the same time, I've got a little Barbie going on the yeah, side, isn't it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm barbecuing. We're kicking the ball around together. Mm -hmm. after, the, after the food's cooked, we sit down, we have food together. Yeah. It's enjoyable for the both of us. Yeah. So I don't resent going outside with them. So killing two birds with one stone. It's killing two birds with one stone. And is that balance? Exactly. Because you know how I love to barbecue, brother. Oh, right? tell me about you it. You know I love to barbecue. And, and I've done the exact same thing. Mm. If, if you can just shut that lid for a minute or two and you can do a little sprint down somewhere, yes, go for it. Because that energy that they expend exactly. will do you some good when you're trying to get them to bed anyway. Exactly, exactly. But we have to look at this from two angles. So that's, that's the physical component of an activity. But we've got to remember this is coming from somebody who is scared to have a child because the impact it will have on them physically. We're assuming by spending energy, what about the changes to a body of a woman? That is interesting. That is right? a good point. She's going to have changes to her breasts. Oh, yes. She's going to have changes to her hips. She's going to have changes to her bum. Yes. I know a good number of women who have been curvaceous. Um, they're quite voluptuous by nature. Yeah. When they have a child, it has been accentuated. Mm -hmm. And some would rather not have that because either it's drawn unnecessary attention or they've had to shift a wardrobe, which means it's, it's taxing financially for that. And then when they try and come back from that, it's taxing on them mentally because they can't get the results that they had before and they, come back to, they can't get back to where they were before. You end up with a baby bod. <laughs> hey? You end up with a baby bod. Oh yeah, exactly. I, I, I that, understand that, that. That is a very real thing. And we can't even sit down here and try and no, imagine what that we is can't, like. No, oh, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I will say, though, personally, I kind of feel that baby body. Do you know, know what I'm saying? <laughs> Come on, put it here, brother. <laughs> it, oh, yo. There's, there's, there's something different about it. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah, that's sad. You know, there's something different. <laughs> I hope I'm not sounding like pubs, you know? <laughs> but no! Homie, 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 I'm not going to lie. <laughs> there is something about that baby bod. You understand. 
Um, I was looking at a picture on holiday when little man was 18 months. Mm. It's visible. I had what looked like a beer belly, even though I don't <laughs> drink beer that much. And my face was round as fuck. Right? Mm. You could tell I'm a dad. Mm-hmm. And then I was talking to somebody who, who works in psychology and all of that. And they're like, and I was talking to them about how I felt about myself at that time. And they're like, Tinto, you were nesting. Mm. That is what a nesting body looks like. Mm. And I'm like, oh, snap. Wow. And then I remembered how his mom would love to rub my belly. <laughs> you know, and I enjoyed that <laughs> shit. <laughs> Oh my guy. Right? <laughs> it felt nice. It felt nice. And I'm like, snap. Yo, yo, right? yo. Dad, right, was my version of a baby bod for a guy. Right? And a little I, dad bod. Yeah, you know, I definitely had a dad bod. Mm. And and I remember hers at the time mm. and rubbing, you know, rubbing it up and, and rubbing, <laughs> you know, rubbing what they call the pooch. You know, the what? The, the pooch. Right? Oh, what God. the? <laughs> <laughs> the pooch, man. What is, what is a pooch? Uh, all it is really is is is, <laughs> it is is what feels like a a, a bigger belly. It's you, called a pooch. Yeah, you know. I've it's, never it's, heard that term it's, before. You know, it's soft. It's nice. It you is know, soft. You know, there's something about it which is. I know. It, yeah, I know. I know. It, it, I, you know. I so, think we better move on from this conversation. <laughs> You know, so, you, you, you know, so there's stuff about that. So, okay, there are physical changes. Yep. But, you know, Nino Brown, it, mentally, it changes as well. You recognize you've shifted. You're yeah. no longer this guy who's slim and agile and can run 40 meters within two seconds and whatever. You know, yeah. you, let, you literally have physical changes to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And when we're talking about the mental aspect that you mentioned about, there's two ways of responding to it. Either, mm. uh, either accept it. Yeah. Or in a way, not reject it. Again, I have to be careful how I say this because there are people who've had a difficult time transitioning from what they were before to what they are yeah. now as a parent. Yeah. Yeah. But would you encourage them to accept it? Mm. So actually, there's, there is something that we haven't touched on. Mm. And that is the issue of postpartum Depression. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've yeah. not even touched on that. Mm. But that is a conversation for a different day. Mm. We're not, we're not going to go into it. I just thought I'd mention it. I think it's worth mentioning because I think it really ties into the question I was just asking you to say, do you accept it or you reject it? Mm. Because if you've, if you've suffered from postpartum depression and everything that comes with it, yeah. it's not going to be as easy for you to say, it is what it is, I'm going to get on with it. Yeah, no, it isn't. Because it's a medical condition, isn't it? But anyway, if it if it is not a case of of that depression, you know, I think it is it is very subjective as to how you deal with that situation. But you have to accept it, isn't it? Mm. You have to accept it. I my my kids are a little bit older now. My son will ring me up every other day mm. and he will say to me, Dad, mm. I need money for this. Mm-hmm. And it's always a valid reason. Always a valid reason. He needs books for school. Mm. He, needs, um, he needs money for the school bus. Mm. So now I have to come up with the means to support him, isn't it? I have to be there. Mm-hmm. I have no choice. Mm-hmm. I mean, he could be lying to me. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> They're smart these days, you know. <laughs> he could be lying to me. But if he's saying to me, Dad, I need, I need, school, I need money for the school bus, mm. I have to find the money. Mm. You know, that in itself is mentally draining on me because now I'm thinking, this kid, is he actually telling the truth? Is he lying? He's got you questioning stuff. No, yeah. I'm questioning. Mm-hmm. And this is years later. The boy's nearly 18 years old. Mm-hmm. He's not a kid anymore. No, he's, a, he's an adult. So the point I'm trying to make is, that emotional stress, it, it, it doesn't stop. It carries on. Even into adulthood, you still stress about your kids. But that's only natural. But that is a level of stress that is acceptable. If that stress becomes overwhelming, 
for whatever reason, then that is a that's a different situation. So what what option does somebody have with the, if that stress does become overwhelming? Oh man, that is a good question. Well, the first thing talking about is important. You can talk to family. If you need to, you can talk to professionals, but there is always help out there somewhere. There's always help. Because if you keep things to yourself, it's just going to build up and you're going to bottle it up and it's just going to build up and build up. And at a certain point, you're just going to explode. Mm. So you have to talk about it. And even us having this conversation for your podcast, there's people that are listening in that might be thinking, oh, wow, you know what? Those are some important points. And I can apply that or I can relate to that in my life. Mm. If there's one person that hears this podcast and is like, wow, you know what? That was poignant or that was important and I understand that and I can relate to it, then you've done a good job. Mm. If there's one person. So there's different ways to, you know, to reach out to people. But I think you know, if you're someone that's going through a situation that has um, some mental stress, child-related, yeah, talk about it. It's interesting you say that because my guest from this particular episode I'm talking about, which is episode 158, and I'd encourage people to, to, to listen to it, particularly if you're thinking about having children, is the first episode that's got me choked up as I was recording it. Wow. And I tried to disguise it as much as I could. But if you listen carefully, at the tail end of that, there's some words that I say, but you can tell I'm struggling to get them out of my mouth. Mm. Because not only was I choked up, I actually had tears in my eyes. Wow. Because I just could not understand how a parent in what I assumed would be a natural setting to be a parent, could have been part of what happened in the episode. Mm. But it also was enlightening in the same breath. So I do not judge my guest parents. I don't judge them for how they responded to it. Yeah. Because we all respond to stimuli that we've been exposed to. Yeah, absolutely. Instead, I used it as fuel to say to myself, I pray to God I'm given the strength that I will not do this to my own son. Mm. And I'm hoping that anybody listening to this walks away. It's a damn shame we could only do point number one. <laughs> or point number two, right? I hope that somebody who is listening to this at least walks away with a reduced fear of what it means to be emotionally involved yes. in your child's life and what the emotional benefit could be. Absolutely. Think about all, the, all of those first you mentioned. Yeah. They, they're literally endless. Oh, Up until it, now, your, yeah. your son is asking you for money and that's the first time that you're questioning whether this is hold real on, or it's not real. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can, I, can I tell you something else? Yeah. My son started working mm. um, at the end of last year. Yeah. Uh, my birthday was in September. Mm. This kid mm. went and bought me a brand new Nike tracksuit and an Arsenal jersey. Come on. And I was not expecting that. I just thought he had a card for me that said, happy birthday, dad. Mm. And when I opened, you know, obviously he gave me you know, a little gift bag. When I got home and opened it and I saw what he had bought me, mm. I was touched. See, that's another first. That is another that's first. That's another first. And this is 18 he, years he, down the line. Exactly. He used his own money. Mm to buy nice gifts for his father. Mm. And in my head, I'm thinking, wow. Mm. And I, I went straight to this guy buy me a house. <laughs> <laughs> Little man, I feel sorry for you, brother. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, sorry, no, listen, the expectations listen. are running wild no, listen, right listen. about here. No, no, I, went, I went a little crazy. I went a little mm, crazy. But the, mm. the point is, yeah. you know, he bought me a nice gift yeah, yeah, using yeah. his own money. Yeah, yeah. And I appreciated it. And financially, the burden for you has reduced, which is point number two. Yeah. Because man's earning his own income. Yeah. And he's not only earning it, he's using it as an opportunity to express appreciation to you. Which exactly. Which the previous concern, which is emotional. Right? Exactly. And then the third one is mentally, you as a dad receiving that from your child, 
Mm. I'll be gobsmacked surprised if that did not make you feel good. I was touched. See, mentally. So mentally, you're elevated. You're feeling good. You're feeling appreciated. Listen, I've told everyone about it. Anyone that will listen to me, I've told. Mm. My son bought me the first proper gift as a birthday present. Amazing, man. Physically, I don't know what that looks like um, for you now, whilst we wrap this up in the last minute that we have. But um, I'm just going to read out what the other ones were, you know, yeah. j- just so that people know what they were. And number three, a guest wrote, when I asked them, do you want to have children? They said, thought of having kids, um, my uterus would unlive itself. I don't even know what unlive means. <laughs> would unalive means. <laughs> unalive. Right, and then uh, they went on to say, I have an adopted child. So yes, I wanted a child, but not on my own. Why? Simple. I don't want them to come out like me and have my traits. Mud thing. Because that just ties into what you were saying about history mm-hmm. and, and what's happened in the past. Um, and then the fourth response, I've got two and I'm done. Double exclamation mark, like really done. I understand that. Being a parent is an extreme sport. I'm glad I had two without knowledge of how life changes. Mm. Right? We can only infer what that has changed like for them. Mm. Number five, um, honestly, right now I'm rethinking if I'm really ready. My only comment, as long as you're doing adult shit, Expect it can happen. Adult shit. Fuck yeah. around, find out. <laughs> um, and then last but not least, uh, it says, nope, life can be challenging. Do I have enough resources? Question mark. We've had a discussion about resources. Yep. Um, their response is no. Do I really know my partner? Question mark. They say no. Have I made some tough, controversial decisions? Question mark. Yes. Do I have a disability? I don't know. It could be my genes. And last but not least, are my genes suitable to have a healthy, happy, resilient child? Question mark. I don't know. And unfortunately, because they're so deep, they really go into the ether of how long is a piece of string. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're in a forest and a twig falls, do you hear it? Mm. It becomes very, very philosophical. Yeah. But Nino Brown, I've only got a minute to just express my appreciation. Thank you for, for your contribution. Thank you. That went by too quick, you know. Way too quick. There's way, way, way too much to talk about. And I intend on having Nino Brown as my co-host on The Feeling Station. So, guys, please show some listen, love for listen. Nino Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be taken over as the host. Hey, 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 relax. <laughs> relax. You guys have been listening to another episode of The Feeling Station. I'm your host, Tinto, and I look forward to catching you in next weekend's episode. Peace. It's the meat we up, yeah. This is my song, this is my jam.